Welcome back. Uh, with Dr. Meghna Guha Thakuta, we have been talking about different aspects of her research and her work with RIB. Uh, Dr. Meghna, one of your areas of special interest is women and violence against them and their relationships, gender relationships. See. Why are women at a disadvantage even in cultures and societies where they are supposed to be looked up to, respected as mothers, daughters and sisters? See? And it's just across the board, all over the world, in every country, we see that women are at a disadvantage. Well, uh, the the short answer is patriarchy, it's, but um, it's a man's world. <laughs> yes, but they are structures of power, right. and and therefore some sometimes women take advantage of structures of power. Sometimes she enjoys power that has been given uh, um, uh, by these structures. For example, if you're a mother-in-law, then definitely you are much more powerful than the daughter-in-law. So. Um, uh, because of <laughs> That's because, true not for it. because the mother-in-law <laughs> is more intrinsically powerful, but because it is a s kind of a post or kind of a status that she re derives from a family that mm -hmm. is dominated mm -hmm. by the fact that it is her son's family. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that um, uh, that women uh, and this has been uh, even when the structures of family has disintegrated, then too. Mm -hmm. the 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 men they are basically basically it is a structure which has both uh, i think consent as well as coercion mm -hmm. so you there there are elements of coercion where you are made to believe in some certain, certain things mm -hmm. but then there are elements which you also want to think that yes this is the normal state of affairs that yes it's true men women should be cooking meals and men should be going to work and it's what these ideas have been uh, produced and reproduced over time through our education, through our media, and what to, and and not only to ch change but also to preserve the privilege mm -hmm. of the powerful. Mm -hmm. So, when you look at Bangladesh, uh, you you see that, for example, that in even our basic law. And, and our basic constitution has allowed women entitlements to be dictated by certain s sanctions of religion where they are unequal. I, as a Hindu woman, for example, cannot get inheritance f by the law of mm -hmm. Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. I have to do a particular will or a particular several sev things. Whereas, you know, and this is by the law that Hindu women in Bangladesh are supposed to abide by any sort of entitlements as sanctioned by their religion. Mm -hmm. So we know that, for example, that these are disadvantage, it's not only a disadvantage that women face, uh, but it is sets the mindset of mm -hmm. a community mm -hmm. that, yes, well, she's not allowed that. And, mm -hmm. and then, of course, if you want to change it, people say that, no, 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 uh, she's, uh, many of the uh, women who have said that this law should be changed. And the men of that same community says that, no, if you allow a woman to inherit, then the Muslims will come and marry her, and then she will not be able to protect the property. <laughs> so these are things that have, are said <laughs> in order to preserve the privileges that there already is. So it's about preserving male privileges mm -hmm. as well as being, uh, you know, a disadvantage, creating disadvantages on women's access to. Uh, women are suffering in all places, like in job opportunities. Uh, there's a gender pay gap even in this country, you see. And this morning, the newspapers and the, the news channels were all gaga about it, not appreciating it, but the, the, the uh, kind of saying sorry that this still exists after 40 years of equal pay recommendations, see. And uh, this is very strange that uh, in the West, women still suffer. And I know that if women suffered in Asia, Far East Asia or Africa, then people take it for granted that yes, see, they're still not, uh, uh, developed enough or not aware enough of the situation, see, 
but this is happening here too. Now let's let's move to something else. You have done work on migration, see. Yes. And how do you see this uh, this huge uh, wave of uh, people leaving the Middle East? I know that's not your area of interest, but leaving the Middle East and trying to go somewhere else. Is it because of uh, they are not unhappy about their own country? Is it because instability? Is it because uh, this is an adventurism or they are just economic migrants? But I'm not to stop just there. Mm -hmm. Even in our own countries, in Asia, anybody who is somebody always has a house or one leg outside the country. See? This is in the psychology. Um, migration as is basically, um, you know, there is forced migration and there is economic migration, which is, which can also be coerced, but because of circumstances, but uh, people have a way to negotiate it. Mm -hmm. But what we see in them, uh, the Syrians and, the, and what is happening in the Middle East and the, uh, the influx of Syrian refugees into different parts of the world is basically a uh, forced migration because of the war, mm -hmm. war-like mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. and the destruction and that is there. Uh, people are fleeing for fear uh, of, and they have no homes to belong to anymore. Right. So they take what they belong, which is their families, and they want to find a home somewhere else. What is so wrong about that? People have done that for ages, right. um, time immemorial. And when when there were no visas, when there were no you know um, constructed fences, uh, border fences, they had done that. Uh, at that time, maybe it wasn't war. Maybe it was some like the tigers or the elephants coming in and destroying their habitation. But this time, it's man-made. Um, so uh, so but. Let's talk about the other one that is much more pervasive, that is mm -hmm. economic migration. And mm -hmm. we know that Bangladesh has w one of the largest uh, economic migrants um, uh, in uh, now populate, population now. Um, that come economic, it is a matter of perception that it is true that Bangladesh is an overpopulated country. It has 160 million. There is always a danger of finding better uh, opportunities elsewhere. This 160 million, yeah. do we have regular census, population census? That was the last census, that uh, was yes, when which was, was that? 2011. 2011. Uh, and uh, yes, so, uh, so that was, I'm just, it's an approximate figure. I don't know the exact one, 160 million people. And it's expected to rise uh, even more. Uh, so there has, it's always been, and it is the, la the second largest, you know, dense density of yeah. population in the world next to China. So, uh, I mean, of course, there is always a danger of other people looking at, look at the electrical fences that we have are all around our country. It's not stopping people from going there because right. people want welfare. I mean, they want welfare and they know if they can't get it within their country, uh, they will get it somewhere else, they will try. And that, whether you call it adventurism or just sheer desperation, mm -hmm. I don't know, but mm -hmm. that's what people do also. Mm -hmm. And um, there are also other things like success stories, that someone, some cousin have gone there, done well for himself. And you know that in Britain, that uh, most of the Indian restaurants we see have been people who have come here to seek better yes, opportunities. 90, 90, 95% and, of them are owned by Bangladeshis. Yes, exactly. So they have brought in their relatives and there has been a steady, uh, you know, um, tr uh, sort of uh, um, a flow of that. I would like to certainly. add something here. So, see, you have done some work on uh, the capital, migration of capital, see, it's like um, the Marwaris yes. in, in Calcutta mm -hmm. and uh, the Chinese uh, in Malaysia. In Malaysia. Mm -hmm. Uh, have you, has anybody looked at this, this, this the, the, the people from a particular district, Sillet, say, yeah. uh, living in London and making it a home 
and being successful. Has anybody, any study been yes, done? Yes, there has been lots of studies recently. Naila Kabir of <laughs> the University of Sussex yeah. have done one of the earlier studies, but there have been other people. And there are many PhDs and uh, MPhils being churned out in the universities <laughs> on that. Um, because it, has, it is a significant uh, thing to look at. Diaspora, mm, diaspora sort of uh, academics is quite a... I, I was thinking of the reverse. I mean, the, these uh, people from Silet are okay. now reinvesting in their All own right, areas. Yes. There, there have been some kind of um, uh, uh, work done on it. Again, University of Sussex, Katie Gardner mm -hmm. has been uh, looking at it for in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. I think she's mm -hmm. still one of one of her um, uh, subjects that she uh, she talks of very frequently. Um, so there has been some work, but they, um, when I looked at the uh, overseas Chinese in Malaysia, for example, and, and we know that there are also Chinese population were the first migrants in all over Asia. There is Chinatown almost everywhere. In every uh, city. In, in every <laughs> city, yes. But in, in Malaysia, they, are, they have been particularly powerful people because they did control the financial aspects for a long time. Um, but, uh, but now I know that they, many of them, although they were uh, sort of uh, because of the poverty in China and because of the also political regime, they had migrated. And these Chinese communities are very much capitalist and they are very much um, business people and they're also very religious. They also practice Buddhism. Uh, so they're very different from mainland China. But interestingly, because they have uh, been the reason for the new tigers to emerge in the Southeast Asia, they are now reinvesting back in China. And China's government has actually a department of overseas Chinese now for these Chinese to come back and, and, and the grandmas even get benefit of that. Great. <laughs> There's something for us to learn from there. I think so. I think so. Thank you very much, yeah. Dr. Magna. Thank you so very it much was a for having, having me here. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to talk uh, to the people and to you. And um, uh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, viewers, for being with us. And uh, I hope that uh, we hope that you have enjoyed the show as much as we have. And uh, it's so kind of Dr. Magna to have made time for us. She was here on a short visit to London. She's leaving London uh, after a couple of days. And uh, we wish her a safe journey. And hopefully, when she comes here next time, we'll have her as a guest again. Thank you for being with us. And we would like to see you again next week. We will have another distinguished guest. In the meantime, take care.